Uh, well, welcome everybody and uh, thank you Nathan for inviting me and thank you for uh, taking the time to come and see this. Um, so a couple of questions, so I, so actually, so first, introduce myself. Right, so my name's Mike Blankovich. Uh, I'm the executive director of a not-for-profit which is headquartered in Ottawa called the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, it's actually a US company, we just happen to run it from Canada. Uh, and it's a, a not-for-profit, we're established as a trade association under US law. Uh, and what we do is we coordinate the activity of thousands of people to build millions of lines of code of software every year to give it away for free. That's what we do. Um, yeah. Uh, so how many people here have ever heard of this thing called open source or free software? All right, so basically what this talk is about is about why open source is the best known model for collaboration and why you should care about it. Because um, you folks are miners. And um, software is something that's becoming increasingly important to you, um, but you haven't yet figured out that your industry, just like almost every other aspect of human endeavor, is becoming a software-centric thing, right? And I'll talk about this during the talk. But, um, and I just want to actually just mention that, uh, although I've been in the software industry my entire 35-year career, yeah, 35, God. Um, and uh, I started off at Bell Northern Research, uh, uh, being a, an Ottawa boy. Um, it, was the, it was the place to get hired back in the, back in the 80s for sure. Um, and I've been in the software industry my entire career. Uh, but I come from a, very much from a mining background. Um, my grandfather um, was a 20 year hard rock miner in Inco back in the, I think the 30s and 40s. Um, he actually you know, you know, emigrated to Canada to, be, to work at Inco in the mines. Um, my dad was born in a place called Creighton Mine that some of you may have heard as a historical footnote. It's by, as I understand it, it's been bulldozed back into the bush. Um, and uh, my, on my mom's side, she's from a little town called Matheson that some of you may have driven through on your way to Timmins. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so I have a, uh, she's from a family of 10 kids. I have a ton of family in the Matheson area, a bunch of them, like uh, I got like three cousins and an uncle that work at the uh, Kirkland Lake Gold Camp at Val, Val Gagne, for example. So um, I'm, I've never been a miner. I've never been involved in the mining industry, but for a guy in the software industry, I certainly appreciate what you folks do. Um, so with that, just a little bit on what the Eclipse Foundation is. Um, I already mentioned it a bit, but just to sort of give you the scale. Um, so we run uh, over 350 open source software projects under the banner of the Eclipse Foundation. And to kind of put this into perspective, in a, any, for the, this has been, f it's growing slowly, actually it's about to do almost a step function, but for about the last five or six years in a row, we've had a code velocity. And by the code velocity, we mean like uh, lines added or lines changed of around 150 million lines of code per year, right? We ship an annual release that's been for 14 years. We've shipped it on time to the day that is, uh, this year was about 84 million lines of code and involved about 82 of those 350 projects. So, um, so this is involving, if you could imagine, a, we have a, a process, if you will, where we can coordinate the activities of, imagine you have 300 software developers, they work for about 200 different, well, 150 different companies in at least 35 different countries around the world. And we can, we have the maturity of process to be able to coordinate the activities of all of those people to deliver 84 million lines of code together on a single day. And we've hit that deadline to the day for 14 years in a row. Right, so one of the things, and I'll, I'm going to make a joke about this later, one of the things that people think about when they hear open source is there's this caricature that the people who build open source software are 30-some-year-old guys who don't bathe a lot and live in their mom's basement. Um, right? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Um, and it's actually, that's actually clearly not true. I mean, we have, and I'll show you a slide there with some logos on it, I mean, we have some of the biggest companies in the world um, not all of which are software companies as members that are supporting projects at Eclipse. So we have about uh, 275 corporate members. We have, as of a couple of days ago, 1,550 committers that work on our, on our projects. So these are people that have earned the rights through a meritocracy process to have right access to our code repositories. 
Um, and so we, it's, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that open source, open source is not crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is like Wikipedia or you know, things where like basically, or Facebook, where anybody can say anything they want or do anything they want. Open source through the meritocratic processes we have, there's a really strict regime that says how you go about getting the keys to the kingdom and becoming part of the community at the level in which you have right access to the code repositories. And the interesting thing about this, I mean, this could be like, a, I think this should be a Harvard Business School um, case study. I mean, we do all of this with 30 people, right? Um, which is, uh, you know, we, sh we ship, or give me, I'll give you, a, uh, give you one example. Uh, back, say, around 2005, when it came to developer tools, um, the two bit most used developer tools in the planet were Visual Studio from Microsoft and Eclipse. We both had about worldwide total tool marketplace. We both had almost exactly 40% of the market. They had over 10 times the number of people working on Visual Studio that we had on Eclipse. Um, and so, so the, the scale of stuff that we do at, at, at the Eclipse Foundation is actually pretty large. All right, so the one thing I want everybody in the room to understand is that you guys think of yourselves as miners. Of course, that's what you do, right? Every single endeavor that humanity is involved in today is becoming software centric. So this, this, this phrase, software is eating the world, comes from a, a blog post that was written by a guy named, or actually a New York Times article, uh, that was written by a guy named Mark Andreessen. Anybody heard that name? Right. So Mark Andreessen, before he was a weirdly conservative venture capitalist, um, was uh, the inventor of the browser. Um, so who here has used a browser today? <laughs> um, and uh, so he wrote this article and basically saying every dollar of venture capital at the time that he wrote this, pretty much every dollar was going into software, right? And, but the one of the things that he, um, the, and the, uh, the, I highly recommend, if you Google that phrase, software is eating the world, you will find this, you will find this article. And I think it is worth, well worth reading. But one of the things that he talked about was, he was talking about the Googles and the Facebooks, sort of the internet aspects of software. But just to give you a couple of examples, um, so software, on aircraft. So the Airbus A300, which was the first fly-by-wire passenger jet, had 23,000 lines of code in it. The A380 has 280 million lines of code in it, right? So, and, it's, and a lot of that is like entertainment and other stuff as well. It's not just the avionics, but the amount of code in the avionics went up probably two orders of magnitude. Between those, between those generations of aircraft. Here's another interesting wrinkle to think about. There are still Airbus A300s flying. The life cycle of an aircraft from the time the inception of the program to the time the last one goes out of service is around 75 years. When you write code that is going to be maintained by your great granddaughter, that's a completely different engineering discipline than writing you know, a web page that's going to be thrown away tomorrow. Um, and interesting thing is Airbus uh, works with us at, um, because they did an analysis of how could they possibly maintain the tool infrastructure for the code um, that they have to maintain for 75 years. And the, on the only answer they could come up with that had a chance was open source. Um, but that's a whole talk in itself. 90% um, of the innovations that are happening in automotive are software driven in today's world. And this is an old slide. When, th th when this, like this, I mean, if I, if I had a, if I were a, room, a room full of automotive people, Mercedes S-Class, infotainment system and subsystem and so on, this is about a 10 year old model a car, right? So your car that you, if you bought a new car today, it has about 100 computers in it. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the expectation in the automotive industry is that in say five to 10 years, that, that 100 number is gonna go down to about 25, but they're gonna be much bigger, faster computers. Basically, uh, I was at a conference in Berlin a couple of, two, a year and a half ago where they, Bosch and NVIDIA announced a um, highly parallel supercomputer that they're gonna be putting into cars. It's a little box about this big, 
and it's the kind of computer that's going to be driving autonomous, uh, autonomous driving systems. Um, and, it's, uh, so, and so the point with those two slides is basically, we, you know, automotive companies think of themselves as automotive companies. Aircraft manufacturers think of themselves as aerospace companies. But in the, every one of those places, um, software is becoming absolutely key to what they're doing. Right? And in terms of um, mattering to industry, right, software bugs and defects are becoming more and more prevalent. So when you think about, uh, just to give you, everyone, I think pretty much everyone remembers the Toyota brake thing. Um, this, so actually this one was really cool. Um, first time a cyber attack actually happened at a running factory, um, uh, which totally freaked the German government out. Um, but this is kind of a cool story, the Boeing 787, the Dreamliner. Anybody might know one of the new Air Canada ones? They're, they're pretty awesome aircraft. That, that aircraft was delayed an entire year because of the braking software. And here's the, here's the cool, kind of cool thing about that story. It's not because the braking software didn't work. It's because the supplier to Boeing that wrote the braking software didn't follow, um, sufficient, sufficiently follow DO178C, which is the standard that you have to use to write safety critical software for, um, for, AV, uh, for aerospace. Right, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, right? The software worked fine. They just couldn't prove that it worked fine um, from, a, from a legal perspective. So they actually had to delay the entire aircraft by a whole year. It has gotten to the point where the CEO of GE a couple of years ago in the annual statement of GE said, every industrial company will become a software company. And so one of the things I like to uh, sort of throw out to you folks to think about is what would a software-defined mine look like, right? So there's um, there's a project happening here in Toronto. Down, I think it's the train yards they're redeveloping, and one of the Google subsidiaries called um, can't remember, uh, Sidewalk Labs, I think it's called, is redeveloping it. And the, the idea is let's build a neighborhood from the internet up, right? Just just mentally think about what would, what would the sort of the what would it be like to build a mine from the, so from the connectivity up, from the, which in my, in my world is basically from the software up, um, where everything was connected all the time and that managing the mine uh, in a software-defined way um, would be, is something that you would think about. But see, the interesting thing is we actually work with GE, and one of the things that GE hasn't figured out yet is that although, I think, I think this statement is right, every industrial company will become a software company. It's also true of every enterprise. By the way, if you like, uh, give you a throw, throw out a little factoid. If you look at the headcount of Goldman Sachs, which we all think of as a bank, 50% of the headcount of Goldman Sachs are software developers. Um, banks these days are basically software development houses that manage money. That's what they, they, that's what they are. And they, get, and they have really interesting, um, interesting problems that they, that they have to solve. Like the bank, the really big trading houses actually physically locate their data centers as close as they can to the stock exchanges because the speed of light is actually buying them a little edge in timing their trades. Like, can you think of, like, isn't that kind of cool? Like, they're actually getting down to, like, speed of light physics in terms of how fast they can, they can do their trades. Um, so, but what they have to figure out is that there are no software companies left that, are, that aren't open source companies. And that's the sort of the start of transition into what I'm talking about open source is. So, give you one uh, example. A couple of weeks ago, Microsoft announced that they were buying GitHub for seven and a half billion dollars. I'm sure many of you in the room have never, don't have a clue what GitHub is, but basically GitHub is the largest single repository of open source software on the planet. And, and Microsoft bought it because they're buying into this, this message that they have to become an open source company. And remember, this is a company that around 13, 14 years ago, their CEO called um, Linux communism, right? And that open source was a cancer. Like these were the phrases. So you can imagine the transition, like, you know, calling people communists and cancerous are, those are not compliments, right? Um, so for it to transition a company like Microsoft from where they were then to, to where they are now is, is a, a, I think a good proof point that there are really no software companies left that haven't mastered the art of 
contributing to and adopting open source inside their, inside their companies. All right, so what is this thing called open source? Um, so at its heart, there's this notion of four essential freedoms. And so when people say the word free software, if you ever hear that phrase, they don't mean free as in free as in free beer. They mean free as in liberty, right? So French has, is, is great because they have you know, two words. Uh, and libre is the meaning of free that is, is really coming at in, the, in, the, in the notion of free software. And this comes from this cr uh, crazy guy named Richard Stallman, um, who is uh, an absolutely unrepentant hippie um, who works at a lab in MIT and came up with this back in the 80s and said, basically, there's four essential freedoms. And he's a C programmer, um, so he has to start, doesn't start at one, he starts at zero. That's a programmer joke, so never mind. Um, so freedom zero, to run the program for any purpose. And actually, it's kind of an interesting thing. So, so for example, there is a license out there in the world uh, called the JSON license. And this guy um, thought he would be cute, and he wrote his license and said, and what, at the very, last, the very end of his license, it says, this software can only be used for good and not evil. Which means it's not a free software license, because evil is a field of use, right? Evil is a purpose. Right? Um, so uh, licenses that say, for example, you can't use this software to run a nuclear plant, that's not an open source license by definition. Study the program and change it. Be able to redistribute copies and redistribute copies of your modifications. So basically what free, the very fundamental of op uh, rules around open source or free software is you can look at the code, the source code, you can study it, you can change it, and you can share those changes with whoever you want for whatever they want to do with it. Right? Seems like both sort of a both a very simple idea, but obviously a really radical idea because for, you know, for most for many many years, you know, software was something that was very very proprietary and everybody held it really really close and that's just the way the world worked. But why open source? So we've answered the what, but why, right? And that basically, it's, this, these are now business reasons, right? It's a better way to do business, right? And I wanna, one of the things I really, I really, really wanna stress here is the world that we live in today would be absolutely impossible without free software and open source. And I, I use those ter terms interchangeably. And what, what do I mean by that? So the fundamental building blocks of the internet. I'm, I'm assuming everybody here has used the internet at least 10 times today, right? right? The, I don't know if you realize this, the internet is this huge accident of history. Basically, there was a couple of things that happened. There was a protocol called TCP IP that was developed by the US government to build a protocol where they could design systems that would survive a nuclear holocaust. That's the, that was the research program that, that created TCP IP, and it existed for about 10 years and then through almost like a bureaucratic error, somebody said, oh, we're just gonna make it publicly available. Then there's this other th protocol called HTTP uh, and HTML, which you, I'm sure everybody here used today. It was developed by this guy named Tim Berners-Lee at a lab in Europe called CERN, which is the Center for European um, Nuclear Research. And they have a strong real rule in Europe at that, that lab that every single thing they do has to be made publicly available. So you have this marriage of this transport, pro transport protocol and this, the protocol that basically created the internet, or the, sorry, the World Wide Web. So TCP is the protocol that runs the internet, and HTTP is the protocol that runs the World Wide Web. And it was an absolute accident of history that those both became um, the protocols that were, became freely available, and that's why they took over the world, and that's how we have the internet today. Who here is old enough to remember CompuServe, right? Like, thank you for being honest. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the world was never going to change because of CompuServe, right? That just wasn't going to happen, right? Dial-up and, and proprietary protocols and proprietary accounts and so on, that was just never going to happen. The radical freeness of open source um, is what drives business today. Um, it enables collaboration, and one of the reasons why it enables collaboration um, is because you have these standard licenses. Uh, I was for many years on the board of the Open Source Initiative that standardizes these licenses called open source. And um, so you have these consistent rules for sharing IP. And one of the things we never actually really talk about, but, uh, but is absolutely true, is the other reason why open source enables collaboration 
is that it is not only is it a hack about on the on um, intellectual property law, it's actually a hack on antitrust law as well, right? So if you have a, if you want to get a couple of companies to work together on a project and you want to create a joint venture and yada yada yada, next thing you know, you're going to be reviewed by the European Union and you know various authorities for antitrust and collaboration that's uh, you know to the detriment of uh, of of the industry, right? Because the outputs from open source collaboration are given away for free, they just, there, there is no antitrust implications because everybody can make use of the work, but you get, you get the first mover advantage um, for driving that forward. And it's really, if you want your software to be widely adopted, free is a really good price, right? Um, and so, and the other thing to keep in mind is, Software is not like mining equipment in the sense that software is one of the only human artifacts that becomes more valuable the more it's used, right? Usually things wear down. I mean, music is kind of the same way, right? The more people listen to the song, the more popular the song is, the more valuable the song is, and so on. Open source software is that is, is, you, you know, follows the same phenomenon. It's free. The more that people use it, the more valuable it becomes. Um, so it really makes that, it really helps um, uh, have rapid adoption of technology. You know, Android came from nowhere to 80% of market share um, in something like six years, uh, be largely because it, it was open source. And in scale, um, we could not run the world we live in today without open source software. The Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, none of those business models work if they have to pay license fees for every server they put into their data center. Like literally, like Google could not exist without open source. Uh, just a current example, um, so this is a, a very popular protocol in MQTT, uh, in IoT, Internet of Things, called MQTT. Uh, I can guarantee you that if you have anything in your minds that are called IoT um, devices, uh, there's, a, there's at least a 70% probability that this is the protocol that they're actually using to talk to one another. Um, and this is when it got open source, and you can just kind of see what the trend line looks like in terms of, uh, in terms of the, uh, this is Google Trends. <coughs> the other thing that open source does is it allows much faster rates of adoption. So if you think, you know, we call it computer science. Well, what is at the heart of science? Science is built around experimentation, right? And what open source allows is computer scientists to cobble together different pieces of software to try things out much more rapidly. When I started my career at, um, in IT, right, buying a new piece of software, acquiring a new piece of software involved non-disclosure agreements, it involved proof of concepts, it involves you know, all kinds of junk. Right? Now when a developer wants to try something out, he goes to the website, he gets it for free, he installs it on his machine, tries it out, and figures out whether or not it's going to help him or not. That's, so you get this innovation through integration at a much more rapid pace. And the fact that he was able to download that without asking anybody's permission greatly accelerates the pace at which they can run these experiments. So basically this, you know, this higher level of experimentation is what's driving innovation. So this, this phenomenon that I'm talking about, when people talk about how fast change is happening and how fast innovation is happening in the world today, you couple with that with the fact that software is driving a lot of that innovation, and you couple that with the fact that the software is largely open source, at least at the bottom level, this, is what's, this, this phenomenon right here is what is rapidly changing the world we live in on a, like on, on a weekly basis. But of course, when you, every, uh, so when you go back to your office, some of you will probably have a general counsel um, you're, or so, you know, some sort of lawyerly type person. You say, yeah, we should start using open source and watch the guy go white, you know. Um, and because they always have these, you know, questions about, you know, is it chaotic? How does it really work? What's this community thing, right? And so they have, you know, are you going to steal our intellectual property? You know, all this kind of stuff. And these are the, you know, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time in my daily life uh, talking to lawyers, you know, basically talking them off of a ledge over these types of questions. But I mean, basically what it really boils down to is, aren't you guys just clowns, right? And this goes back to what I was saying before about, by the way, this is kind of a joke because this actually is the core Eclipse development team <laughs> um, going out for lunch one day. Um, so the, uh, but basically it's like, 
is open source really serious for business? And, and, and is, is what underpins a lot of these questions. And it's particularly as we get enterprises and industrials getting more and more involved in open source. Um, like all the software vendors have already become open source savvy. The next wave of open source adopters are going to be enterprises and industrials. And they always have this feeling that, you know, this community, this thing, how can a community build something that I would want to use? Right? Now, we, we have real requirements and, you know, like there's like, they just have this sort of credibility gap um, that pictures like this don't actually really help much. <laughs> Um, but just to give you a couple of examples, and I mentioned this earlier, I mean, like, so we've, uh, actually, I missed this, I need to update this slide for Photon, but, you know, we've done 14 years in a row where we've shipped our major annual release on time to the day, right, which is actually fairly incredible, right? I mean, there aren't a lot of software companies that can hit that level of predictability. And, and like I said, these are, these are large, large releases with, you know, 80 some projects and, you know, over 80 million lines of code. So this is not a trivial amount of software we're talking about. This, I mean, I'm, to put that in perspective, I'm pretty sure you're operating your minds, well, simulations always take lots of code, but uh, other than sort of simulations and that kind of stuff, you're probably operating your mind on significantly less code than, than 80 million lines. Um, and then, but then the other question is, why do companies contribute, right? What is, if they can get stuff for free, why do they give back, right? And there's a whole bunch of reasons. One is it's a great way to save money. So the thing that happens is once you start using soft open source software, you start finding bugs, right? You have the source code, you can fix the bug. If you don't contribute that bug back to the, to the community, what ends up happening is they ship their next release and you have to fix the same bug over and over and over again, right? So it's, it actually saves you money to start engaging. Um, the only way you can influence the direction of an open source project is to actually put people into it. And then thirdly, um, these in this day and age, if you want to recruit good developer talent, you really need to, uh, you really need to, 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 to have some open source uh, cred, street cred uh, to get those people in the door. But it's also it's important to remember that you know, puppies can also be free, um, but there's you know, care and feeding. When somebody gives you a puppy, it's like, oh, thanks. Right? <laughs> it's like, because you have to bathe them, you have to feed them, you have to train them, you have, and open source software can be like that sometimes as well. So it's not that, it's not that open source software single-handedly, you know, rewrites the rules of economics. Um, there is, and one of the, one of the uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek lines is that, you know, proprietary software you sell to people that have more money than time, and open source software is what you give to people that have more time than money. Um, and there's a certain element of truth to that, but all of the other benefits in terms of time to market and innovation and so on are much more prevalent in the open source world and that tips the balance uh, in favor of open source. Um, but it's, the, the point of this slide is really that it's, it's not, free is not completely free, like there's no cost of, it's, it's, this is not a zero cost of ownership proposition. You, you might move some costs around, it's not zero, but it's, it's still, it's still going to be um, cheaper in the long term. So the kind of things that we do to, to um, move these projects, our projects forward, that we, these are the kinds of things that every open source foundation has to provide. So we have to provide infrastructure for development, we have to provide process and governance. There's community development like conferences. It's probably not unfair to say that a lot of open source communities are actually fueled by beer. Um, I've heard rumors that miners like beer too. Um, IP management and licensing is also another, another really big one as well. Um, so we have a number of Eclipse working groups that, uh, um, that work on particular domains. Um, I'm going to go th mention a, a little bit about one of them just to give you a sam like one sample of the kind of technology that we build at Eclipse. Um, and um, this quote here is from the CEO of Bosch Software Innovations. And Bosch is a company that we work with a lot. Uh, this guy is actually on our board of directors. And I'm, I'm sure everybody here has heard of Bosch. And you realize that that's a very large, very conservative German company. Um, and to get them to actively engage in open source um, is a real good proof point to what I was saying earlier, but every industrial is going to become a software company. And, and these guys, much more so than GE, are buying into the, the benefits of, of open source. Um, so it, just in our IoT community, uh, we have 36 projects, so it's roughly about a tenth of the pro project population. It's about 2.4 million lines of code. There's about 280 developers that works on this stuff. Uh, this is the eyeball chart with, uh, you'll, I mean, 
there's pretty, some pretty serious companies there, Bosch, Siemens, uh, Intel, uh, Red Hat, Ubuntu, um, so there's, and IBM, so there's some... There's where, some where the mining was. Yeah, that's, I don't, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, and what we're building uh, in Eclipse IoT is the idea is that we want to build a complete open source uh, software stack uh, for IoT. Uh, so everything from communications protocols to device gateways uh, to all of the cloud infrastructure that you need to build IoT solutions. Um, in terms of the ecosystem around this, uh, we've got like OEMs like Bosch and Siemens involved, a uh, really good cross-section of software vendors, um, lots of uh, hardware manufacturers, um, some telecom operators like France Telecom, well, Orange is now used to be France Telecom, uh, Deutsche Telecom. They actually, Deutsche Telekom actually uses uh, one of our projects to run their home automation solution that they're selling in Germany. Uh, then we have services, and then we also have a really active uh, research community uh, with a number of research uh, institutes in, in Europe and, and universities as well. Um, we also do these test beds um, where we do, and so some examples of things that we've done is you know end-to-end -end asset tracking management. So, so this is a mix of open source software from Eclipse and some proprietary software from, uh, in this case, uh, Eurotech, I think, um, where they're basically um, tracking boxes going through a, a supply chain. Um, then uh, production performance management. Uh, this was actually about uh, manage, um, measuring the performance and trying to do predictive maintenance for really large industrial machines. Uh, it would actually probably be pretty applicable to some of the big, uh, big um, machinery that you have uh, in your minds. A lot of the stuff would be very, very similar. Your, your machines are probably more mobile, but uh, I mean, that's really just a connectivity problem more than, um, more than changing the software architecture. And just to throw in one example of things that have been built um, that are actually mining related is um, uh, there's a company in Sweden uh, called Thingwave that built a smart rock bolt. Um, so basically, they're constantly monitoring information about elongation, strain, breakage, and so on. Uh, and it has near real-time alerts. Um, so if it starts to get to the point where the, the bolt might actually um, break, um, it, you're going to get someone is going to get an alert on a console. Uh, and the, uh, it's, it is battery powered. I can't remember exactly what low-level protocol it uses. Um, but it's a 10-year lifespan um, per bolt, which is, which is not bad. Um, and um, what they use from Eclipse uh, IoT is uh, they can do over-the-air software updates um, on the bolt in the mine uh, using uh, one of our uh, a project called Eclipse Lesson that does, that does stuff for doing over-the-air over updates. And so just a couple of parting thoughts to wrap up. Um, so, you know, many people have heard this phrase, digital transformation, and you can read books about what digital transformation means. From my personal perspective, you can really boil down the notion of digital transformation in many cases, not all, but in a lot of cases, it boils down to, we have to change our culture to be software-centric. Um, and that's, that's, and you know, become, the company has to become more digitally native. And what that means to a large degree is becoming internet native, and coming, becoming software centric. And as I said before, I mean, you can't claim to be competent in software until you are also competent in open source. Th these are part and parcel of the same thing. They're no longer differentiated. Um, and so you, if you're going through the exercise of digitally transforming your, um, your organization, you have to start thinking about what does that mean in terms of acquiring open source and contributing to open source, um, contributing back to open source. And our future is being built on open source. I mean, like the internet, as we work every day in our lives, the infrastructure that surrounds us, all of the basic building blocks of that tower um, it, it, it are, are being are, uh, in open source. Whether you're talking about Linux, uh, talking about TCP IP, you know, the basic infrastructure of our planet is becoming it's increasingly software centric and, uh, and, and that is becoming increasingly open source centric. So this is a journey. It's a process, not an event. Um, so start to engage um, with uh, various open source projects and communities, learn. Uh, and, and I think experiment, uh, ex experimentation is th at the heart of all of this, right? It's not about saying, oh, all of a sudden we're, we do open source, because um, that is not how it works. You actually have to learn 
communicate, make mistakes, keep trying. Um, uh, and but I think the benefits uh, are definitely there if you if you stay at it. And with that, thank you very much. I hope it was helpful.